Okay, ready to do this? Okay, so there I'm also going to go to discovery and what we look like doing that. So. Hi guys. Uh, everybody can hear me okay, right? Yeah. It's a little quiet. All right, is that better? All right, so this talk is on discovery. Um, I am a senior security consultant with security. I do the magnetic that I've been talking about in the last talk. Um, and a lot of times what we do is pretty much looking at mapping out a company's external infrastructure and how we can go and use that to break in. Um, most of the bad guys are doing the exact same thing. The cool thing is with the advent of bug bounties in the last several years, a lot of research has gone into a lot of this. But there's a lot of other stuff that we do that bug bounties aren't quite allowed to and it crosses the line. Um, so the point of discovery, we pretty much want to find out three things. We want to find out what the printer is, what domains the company has, what devices out there. You know, I found anything from a random web server that had domain cred sitting inside of a backup file that they had just copied over from inside. That you know, since it wasn't, like, since it was outside, they didn't leave any packet behind it, and was able to compromise that to random branch offices that aren't secured that have a full VPN back into the main. Um, we also look for email addresses. It's pretty much, you know, one that's used in phishing for targeted attacks. It's a lot of the, the high skill level attacks are going to targeting specific people. Um, the other thing we use it for is password spraying. And we'll get more into how we use that. But it's pretty much breaking in and getting valid credentials. And then with credentials, we can usually find some way from the outside actually into the network. So first we'll look at the printer. Um, pretty much going for domains, networks, as I said, and other resources. Plenty of developers, you know, accidentally committed, you know, some sensitive password, and then realized they could erase it with the next commit, but it's still sitting there in the commit history on GitHub or various other things like that, unsecurity of US pockets, etc. So the basic steps for domain hunting is pretty much we usually start off with some known information. So for example, say we're going after google.com. We know google.com is their main domain. We'll go and wonder who is on it and actually parse their data and I'll put it after this. We pick out searchable things, things that'll usually be unique to them. Like we don't search by zip code because that would give you a lot of false positives. But things like registering email are usually very good at finding other you know, possible domains. And we'll also use the reverse of those services to actually search through stuff. And then we repeat. So using Google as an example. Um, if you look at just Google.com, you've got the registered organization is Google LLC. You've got the phone number is 650-253-0000. And you've got the registered email or DNS dash admin at Google.com. So right off the bat, and I like to use view DNS, but there's lots of other sites that do this. So searching for Google Space LLC, you get a whole list of other subdomains that you would never think of belonging to Google, such as 2GUGE.com, whatever the hell that is, and, you know, that weird Android thing, I've never heard of that either. Um, then we go on to going and searching for the actual registering email. You see we find a bunch of other different sites. You know, and a lot of these could be junk sites and they just register domains so nobody else would get it and stuff like that. Um, and then from there, this is kind of interesting, searching for the phone number, found um, cordon.cx. And that's actually from a pretty well-known uh, security researcher who I assume works at Google because the actual who is information has his address and all the other good stuff. So we do that and we find we get a big list of domains and pretty much, you know, all the, every domain we can find on this one. And then we'll go look for subdomains. And usually this consists of checking public sources, um, the certificate transparency project now, any cert that you get in an actual public like certificate is registered in a public database where any other domains on that cert are also visible. You can easily search that. Uh, DNS dumpster, they go and record information collected from SSL certs um, from just scanning on the internet 
and they make it all available, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, then we go in brute force domains. You take a big word list, and you go and you just try them all and see what resolves to an IP address. Or if they all resolve to a certain IP address, you know, it's a well part domain, and ignore that one, you get all the others. There are so many tools that do this, like ridiculous amounts of tools. I'm pretty sure there's been one release every week in the past month of somebody else coming out with some new subdomain enumeration tool. Um, my favorite is for just the enumerating stuff, sublister. Um, works very well, checks several different sources, you know, works fairly fast. The harvester is an old favorite. Aquatone is relatively new. I've heard great things about it, I haven't played with it much myself yet. For actual group forcing, I'm all about GoBuster. And 100 threads, I can tear through a massive word list in no time at all. And subgroup works as well. NastyNS is an insane amount of testing, but also tends to give you a lot of false positives just because it's sending so many packets. Um, but here's an example of running the sublister against coredump.cx. Um, and it actually came out with 13 different subdomains that they've had. Uh, Google.com using GoBuster and actually just brute forcing, just started firing off. You know, found it was something like four or five hundred different domain subdomains. <coughs> and again, all this stuff right here is heavily developed by Bug, Bo by, uh, Bug Bunny, Bug Bounty Hunters, sorry. Just because this is where they get all their money from, finding new things out on the internet. So for actual network hunting, it's actually very similar. You take a known IP, so say you go and resolve Google.com with IP address it comes to. You can go and go who is on that IP, and then you get the same types of information, contact name, uh, contact emails, company name, so on and so forth. And then you use mainly Aaron as a great reverse, who is a site that lets you search for registered name and company names. There's other paid for services that let you search for other things, like phone numbers and stuff like that. And then as you find more stuff, you'll find more things to look for. You know, you do more who is things on more stuff, you get more things and so on and so forth. And you just keep building through it, looping through it. So with a random Google IP, I got this, Google LLC again. Uh, I got their address, if you're using the pay for services, you can search there. I also got a phone number and a contact email address. So going through Aaron, looking at Google Space LLC, got me a whole bunch of domains. Aaron is kind of funny in that it's not case sensitive, but it is letter sensitive. Like, if you search for Google, it will only give you exactly what matches Google. What they don't publish is that you can use a wallet. You say Google Star, it gives you everything. So this turned up a whole bunch of other ranges. And if you actually follow these through and actually click through on them, you'll find all the different IP ranges that they pretty much own. Looking for other sensitive assets, um, GitHub Secrets, as I said before, there's a lot of tools that are made specifically for searching through Git history, where it'll just go clone all the repos from a company and go through every single iteration back looking for keywords like password or secret or key or anything like that. Um, Trufflehog will also go and look for strong passwords that you'll usually have, like API keys or use like a random thing, and it'll use some math magic that I'm not totally familiar with to go and point those out. Uh, AWS buckets, there's a lot of programs that are useful for brute forcing buckets, looking for unsecured buckets. There's been a lot of people that have been on, like pretty much having things like database backups and stuff like this from all their AWS infrastructure sitting without a password there. Um, you can also find, if you look in, you know, just Google Dorks, you can find a lot of people's AWS stuff. You'll find confidential reports and stuff like this that are just sitting out there getting indexed that they don't realize is there. It's pretty much a lot of this stuff comes down to your creativity. You'll find things that look suspicious. You'll want to kind of pull further and you'll find something else and go down a lot of different rabbit holes. The next thing to look for are email addresses. Um, this, there's also a lot of stuff, not so much in the bug bounty area because it's not really something that the bug bounty people are concerned with. You know, most bug bounties, they say you're not allowed to touch the employees. And employees are all out of scope. For actual attackers or for you know, doing actual penetration testaments, that's not the case at all. They're not employees. <coughs> so 
There's lots of tools that go through various uh, public sources. Um, search for Google, search through various documents that are on the site, so look at the author, metadata, pretty much. We go through security breaches, and a lot of you are familiar, like LinkedIn has a security breach, um, MySpace did, Dropbox did, Adobe did. They just keep on happening. Usually these end up in the public, and we go and actually take them and turn them into a searchable database. So we can search a domain and pull up all the credentials and all the usernames that have, you know, been released. And even one that I say it's not a big deal because it's, you know, like Adobe, everything is encrypted and nobody has the encryption key. All the email addresses are still wrapped there in plain text and we can still use those in the other attacks. Um, and then social media. LinkedIn is great for getting people's email addresses and user info. And I'll show you, I don't want to ruin the surprise, it's really cool. Um, so various tools, the Harvester is great for going and scraping email addresses off the web. You pretty much just run it, give it a domain, tell people about everything, it'll search Google, Bing, various other places. Um, documents, there's Power Data, and now a Python equivalent, PyData, that'll pretty much go through, search for DocX, PowerPointX, um, XLSX files on websites in the domain, download them all, and then just pull all the metadata from them, PDFs as well. And then there's various databases that all they do is get user info. And that's their business is documenting people's email addresses to sell back to marketers and whoever else. Um, so just as an example, this is the harvester being run against Google. Obviously with Google, there's a lot of garbage in there. You get dumb addresses that can't possibly exist. But you also find a lot of legitimate ones. Uh, this is running the exit tool against Google. And you can see there's lots of employee names are in there. You know, we first run Office and ask you what your name is. If you type it in, then every single document you can save from then on out has that embedded in it. So when people make forms and stuff like that, put them up on the site, and then I get the name. Security breaches. So LinkedIn, Adobe, Dropbox, uh, MySpace. There was actually a massive dump just released this year that's pretty much a, like it's a collection of lots and lots of plain text credentials from lots and lots of other dumps. Um, and I think with these dumps is the weaker ones, like LinkedIn, all the passwords were MD5 hashed, or no, shell one hashed, which is relatively easy to crack. There's websites that have competitions on who can crack the most of them. And then people like me can just go and download all the cracked hashes. So I have 99.95% of the plain text LinkedIn passwords, you know, including my own, unfortunately. I'm, I'm in there too. <laughs> and so this is just a, a look into, you know, for android.com, this is our actual internal database that we use. This is all public information, 10 minutes of Googling can pull it all together. It takes quite a bit more to get in database form just because it's pretty sloppy data and takes some conditioning to get it to usable, but still, it's all, it's all pretty much there. Now, the actual social media sites. Um, LinkedIn displays users to you within three degrees of separation. It's pretty well known. It's trivia, trivial to build a recruiter account. Everybody goes and accepts connection requests from recruiters. Um, and most email addresses for a company follow a pattern. The exception of it's usually like the, the people that were in the beginning of the company usually have like their first name at domain and everybody else is following some other pattern. But there are sites that you can just query that will give you what the pattern is, whether it's first initial, last name, first name, not last name, so on and so forth. And so what we can do is we can go use my, this is just one that we use. I just created this account a couple of months ago. I've got 1,400 connections in the Kansas City area. I can see everybody. <laughs> like, this is uh, Google.com. I don't know any Google people personally. I never remember connecting with anybody from Google. I could see pretty much 83,000 different people. Um, linked, LinkedIn only goes up to 1,000, so I'd have to do something clever to actually go and get the rest of them. But so with most companies, I can get about 80% of their staff. Um, if I don't already have them as connections, I just go plug the company and just start connecting with everybody. 
And then, you know, Audi is one, one, probably like one or two at a time. If that many head with me, I can see everybody else. And then that opens up a bunch more, and with a bunch more, before you know it, um, I'm in with everybody. Some of you might even be friends with the recruiter. <laughs> so, okay, good. So we've got a whole huge list of names. We've built email addresses from it based on whatever pattern. Now we want to get valid credentials. Now this, from the bug bounty perspective, or anything else, this is getting into the stuff that's illegal if you're not contracted to do this. Um, everything before, you know, LinkedIn is kind of a gray area. You know, kind of, you know, earlier is no touch, this is light touch. Now we're getting into the bad touch stuff. Um, <laughs> so just saying, don't do this unless you have permission. <coughs> So the next thing we would do is look for endpoints. Um, usually you want places that will use credentials, and ideally you want something where they have Active Directory hooked up, because that's going to be going into their actual backend domain. Um, look for Outlook Web Access, or look for VPN, Citrix, you know, so on and so forth. You can find all sorts of random things. Uh, then we go and try to see if there's a way of figuring out what valid usernames are. Um, some services are very well secured in that they give you the same message no matter what. Some of them, like OWA, is terrible for hiding valid user accounts. There's usually a two to three second delay if you have a valid user account and an incorrect password. And I'll, I'll show you in a screenshot. I can very quickly go through, find out which of my accounts are actually legitimate Outlook accounts, and uh, then go and see what the actual pattern is. I've had times where the pattern I had was wrong, and then I went and changed out all the other stuff I got from LinkedIn to the correct pattern and got a whole bunch more. So after you do that, you actually do password spraying. Um, those of you that aren't familiar with password spraying, it's, you know, everybody knows what brute forcing is, right? It's where you take an account and you try every password until you get in. That doesn't work pretty much anywhere anymore because most people have you know, most services have a lockout. After three incorrect attempts or five incorrect attempts, the account is locked, no more attempts will work. Password spraying tries one weak password against all of the valid accounts that you have. This is really, really effective, especially because of the 90-day password change policy. I guarantee you, everywhere in your organization, somebody has a password spring 2018, or winter 2017, or winter 2018, or spring 2018, bang, or Spring 18, so on and so forth. We almost always get in with these. And we will find valid users in pretty much every company. It's actually, this is the reason why NIST changed their guidelines to say that you don't need to expire passwords anymore. Because it just, it trains people to make them predictable. And even if, you know, it's only one out of a thousand people set their password as that, that's all we need. Um, it gets even better with something like Outlook Web Access where we get in one person's account, a whole privilege account, doesn't get us anything else, but now we have a global address list, which gives us all of the AD accounts, and then we can password spray against all of those and find 20 more with that weak password who aren't even exposed anywhere on the internet. And this worked up before, and then you, know, you find out one of those persons has VPN access, you get in a VPN and it's game over, you just compromise the name. So you look for hopefully domain join login group points, um, one of the usual, you know, outside of just scanning everything, you can usually look for our next records, get an idea of where their email goes. Um, if you bounce a message, you can kind of see where, you know, an IP address of every server along the way. Um, you can do light port scanning, just looking for web servers, do something like Eyewitness or Go Witness, and I'll just go through all the ports, you, all the web servers you give it, and just take a screenshot. And then you quickly just cycle through the screens. Search, Shodan, Google, etc. You know, and I'll show you an example. Here's just in your URL, IBM.com login. Gives me a whole bunch of different IBM.com <coughs> login sites. I didn't click on any of them because they're not our client. That's pretty good. Um, so looking at the differences between valid and invalid accounts, you can look at error messages. You can also look at time delays, like the thing without them. Um, and you can also a lot of times look at account registration pages if they support it, where you go and put in valid accounts and it says this account's already taken or something of that sort. So here is valid 
Active Directory domains. You can also, with Outlook Web Access, actually brute force the domain itself if it's like a domain slash email because um, it's with invalid domains, it always gives you no delay. With a valid domain with an invalid user, you get a three second delay. So this right here, I found that that was the actual valid domain. Then from there, you can go in and then just spray all the user accounts. And you can see all the ones with no delay are the valid user accounts. And you know, right there, I have all those in my arsenal. And then, you know, with spraying, we usually only do it once every two hours, just so we don't block anything out. And it's it's crazy how quiet this attack is. Most people aren't looking for it and don't expect it. And then, you know, we get in places. Uh, we pretty much run out this. So we space it all out. Here's an example of actually successfully password spraying. Um, we had several time to go, but you can see Spring 18 right here got us into this account out of all the other failed ones. And we were actually able to go from here and compromise this plan. So conclusion, everything is screwed, right? What's the point? Um, there's several things that we've done to make all this stuff a lot harder. Private registrations on domains make discovery a pain in the butt. Um, when you do a who is and you don't get any information, you don't get any information. So you don't really have anything to search for to go for the other ones. And there's, you know, there's certain services that'll keep a history and kind of search through the history and stuff. But the more stuff that's private, the more difficult it makes it. Use strong password policies, like actual real strong password policies, not the, uh, you know, uppercase, lowercase, one number, one special character. Uh, eight characters long changes every 90 days, the 80 default. And it's a terrible password policy because it breeds predictable passwords. Usually a good password policy is something more along the lines of checking for white, uh, checking against actual blacklists, check the most common compromised passwords. There's lots of sites that make them available. Um, have I been pwned? Has a list you can download that has all the most common passwords you check against. Check company names, check seasons pretty much months, all that stuff, and then just fail a password change if any of those match. Doing that right there makes things so much more difficult because then we don't get in the spring. And we have to go and look for actual vulnerabilities in the outside applications, and that's much tougher. Um, the other thing is use two-factor authentication on all external endpoints. There's nothing that stops us harder than this because we've had plenty of times on certain clients where we get in and then it's like, you just sent a text message to your cell phone. It's like, <laughs> okay. And then you know, like the clock started. Like, all right, this guy's gonna change his password soon because he's like, what the hell is going on? So it's like scrambling to find some place that doesn't have two-factor. If you have multi-factor authentication pretty much on all of your external, anything logable outside, VPN, Citrix, you know, your email, everything else, it, again, stops this cold. Any questions? Have you looked at the, uh, the GDPR debacle? Who is data? Is that gonna? Yeah, I don't know how that's gonna roll out. Where they may apparently just stop collecting the information altogether. Yeah, yeah. we'll we'll see how that goes. So SSL certs are required to have your organization listed there as part of verifying the identity. Like it is. You see census.io, which is an index of all the SSL certs out there in the planet, coming more to the forefront as opposed to doing what we used to do. Well, even more than the census.io, would be more than the cert.sh, the actual transparency project, because that just keeps an open searchable ledger where you can just look in the domain and get all that, all that data. I think it'll definitely be more. Yeah, I guess as going forward, that definitely be another way to go and find domains is searching for actual stuff in the certificates. How much does that change if you're looking at where they're speaking for actual Well, I may be six. So from a discovery viewpoint, this is way more um, important than IPv6. Because IPv6, you can't just scan the subject. No, I think what I'm asking is if you have an IPv6 after 
address. It tells you what AT means, what actual building, what network you're on, and it links it out as you move around on your device. Yet to the one I'm wondering about what the change be how much that's a lot of information given out. It is. Um, usually the stuff that we're attacking isn't so much the things that are mobile, the things that are actually like for example, most cell phone providers right now are exclusively using IPv6 with IPv4 and having somewhere along the line. And none of that gives us anything to talk about. Um, at this point, it's, with all that IPv4 stuff being so prevalent as it still is, that's still the low hanging fruit. Um, it'll definitely change as technology changes as it always does. But one big thing with IPv6 is just the lack of scale. That's a huge deal for us because you know usually I do an external assessment. I pull up my IP range and I look for active hosts. With IPv4, that's pretty easy to do. IPv6, that's next to impossible. There are just too many possible hosts. So using something that leaks the information of what's out there, such as DNS, is much more important in that area. Can I train my sim to look for your spring? Yeah. If you go and just track. Um, failed login attempts. If you see a box getting slammed with just general failed login attempts, um, you could do it from the same IP. There's ways of going and, you know, there's lots of tools. There's a new one just came out, Doxy Proxy, that will go and pretty much rotate your password spray attempts through, you know, a couple of dozen proxies. But are you attacking one box with a spray? With one box. Credentials? One box, multiple user accounts, one password. Yeah, so we're, right, we're not locking out accounts, we're not, we're only hitting one. Yeah, I guess what I'm trying to think of, um, my limited uh, use of sims from my perspective is that if you're putting this hash value of the, the BS password a thousand times into my network, it, it, is that something I can trigger to see this, this BS Password you're putting in that many times. A lot of times logs won't show you what the password is. So yeah, the that's application <laughs> really hash yeah. Is. You'll see a failed login attempt though on the domain controller, right. and you should be able to feed that into your sim. Yeah, that's what yeah, you want to look at. You don't want to get the passwords because passwords logged in the logs is a vulnerability in and of itself. <laughs> Yeah, and it'll usually just be one after the other. It's not a. You don't care about that? Mm -hmm. that, that? That's so easy to see. I mean, yeah, I mean, well, A, <laughs> it's not a big deal because we've had times when we've done a password spray and then our IP got live and it's going to put these pop up on the browser and then we've attacked them somewhere else. Like getting your source IP is very easy to change. There's, I don't know how many yeah. proxy systems and stuff like that. I mean, when my buddy set up a server in his basement and he's getting this type of attack, just root password from China, yeah. and, and his log's filling up. Yeah, it's just, it's a given now. Any other questions? Yeah, I'm good. All right, come on.